Sandley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure, healing, miracle-working love. I want to talk to you today about something very, very important, especially important geopolitically to Israel. I want to talk to you about China and the kings of the East, Israel and her unknown enemy. Actually, I'm going to speak to you specifically about Sino-Asian emergence, the formation and evolution of the end-time kings of the East. In Isaiah, Ishawahu, in the Tanakh, chapter 49, we read, Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sinem or Sinim was the name of a distant oriental religion. William Jacinius, a German biblical critic and Semitic language scholar, commented that the Arabians and other Asiatics called China Sin or Chin. The Chinese had no special name for themselves, but either adopted that of the reigning dynasty or some high-sounding titles. This view of Sinim or Shinim suits the context which requires a people to be meant from far and distinct from those from the north and from the west. Now let me give you a scripture from the Brit Hadashah, the Jewish New Testament, from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 12. It says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Let's talk about the river Euphrates. God created the Euphrates River. In the Torah, in Breshith, in Genesis chapter 2, we read, the name of the third river is Tigris, the one that flows east of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The river of the same name marked one of the boundaries of the land promised by God to Abraham and to his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and to the end of his seed line. In the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, it is often referred to simply as the river, or Han-Nahar. In the Torah, you can read that in Genesis chapter 15. The Euphrates marks the northeastern border of the land that God promised to Abraham. The Torah tells us, in, again in Genesis 15:18, To your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now God tells the Israelites to go to the promised land. You can read in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, the first chapter, God told Israel, start out and make your way to the hill country of the Amorites and all their neighbors in the Arabah, the hill country, the Shephelah, the Negev, the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites, and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. In the Torah, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, God told Moses, every place where you set the soles of your feet shall be yours. Your borders shall run from the wilderness to the Lebanon, and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the Western Sea, which, of course, the Western Sea would be the Mediterranean. And in Tanakh, the prophet Zechariah, in chapter 9 of his book, tells us, Your king will make peace among the nations, among the Goyim. He will rule from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Now let's talk about the great Euphrates River and the prophecy of Revelation that I read to you in chapter 16. The great river Euphrates is the water boundary separating the Holy Land, promised by God to Moses, Abraham, and Israel, from Asia to the east. Because of dams constructed in the last century to divert water for irrigation, there are at times little or no water in the riverbed. The act of the sixth angel that we read about in the book of Revelation in pouring out his vial upon the river Euphrates may have more to do with soil impaction or alignment than hydrological forces. However, it could be, notice I said could, that the Euphrates River, due to some kind of engineering or dredging, may be fed with a network of tributaries in the future. At any rate, regardless of the Euphrates having more or less water or none in the future, it will be a viable variable in the logistics of the future and the eastern region kings who play a key part in end-time prophecy. <laughs> Let's talk specifically about those kings of the east. In the last days, the Bible shows us there will be a major military, political, 
an economic force that arises from the East. This force will not be from just one national entity, but will be a confluence of several regional powers in the East, and not just from the Pacific Rim. Direction in the Bible is always oriented from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem, Israel. So these kings of the East can represent forces in the Near East, the Middle East, and or the Far East. This force may be an amalgamation of national and cultural social interests, flowing together for advancement, protection, control, and power. Notice one or more of the region kings may be a separate entity, however working either in cooperation with or separately from the other region kings. However, these region kings will move simultaneously or in approximation to or with each other. The timing will be in prophetic precision and will be a synergistic force that will be in effect designed by God as pawns to bring about the establishment of his kingdom on earth. However, even though this force from the east fits into the end time plans of Almighty God, the regional EPM, economic, political, and military powers, will not have as their goals the service of God. They will in effect be drawn, inspired by Satan to do his bidding. There are or will be several players in the field of region kings. In the following discussion, we will review some of the major players. However, keep in mind that any power adjacent to the Euphrates River and beyond easterly may be a candidate for this role. This would include present-day Iraq, Syria, eastern Turkey, the southern steppes of Russia from the former USSR, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, Mongolia, North and South Korea. Now let's talk specifically about some important facts about China. China's Silk Road resurrected. One belt, one roll. The 21st century version of the ancient Silk Road traveled by Marco Polo. President Xi Jinping hosts the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. The BRI Summit is Xi's one trillion, that's with a T, plan to build state-of-the-art roads, ports, pipelines, and airports that will link China to 110 countries around the world and make Beijing the epicenter of world trade for decades to come. This initiative is a brazen attempt to seize worldwide economic leadership away from the United States. Xi sees an opportunity to bind emerging trade partners to him by offering them access to China's vast consumer market. Also, Xi is offering a lot of money and infrastructure to a lot of recipient countries who have a pressing need for their economies to be modernized. China is effectively applying soft power in a very visible way. It wants to become what the USA has been until now, the leader of the world economy. Among the massive infrastructure projects being offered to potential partners, China wants to build a port in Pakistan, complete a China to Myanmar pipeline, and access to Middle East crude oil, and then dredge and deepen the historic Greek port of Piraeus. For Xi, this means showing that the rest of the world is girded to China, and that all roads lead to Beijing. Now, you'll need to read in the podcast specifics of what China is doing and what it has planned to do and what it is planning to do in the future. China today is still one of the most repressive forces of Christianity in the world, with many Christians belonging to the house churches being tortured and imprisoned. Notice, the house churches are those not registered with the government. In an attempt to control Christians, the government requires that all churches register with the government. The government-controlled church is called the Three Self Patriotic Movement. Millions of born-again believers are part of the house churches and are not aligned with the government-authorized churches. There are about 12 million registered believers in the official state churches, but over 100 million believers in the non-registered house churches, which the government persecutes. The Chinese government tells the churches that are registered with it, the three self-churches, where they can worship, who can worship, only those over 18, and what they can teach. See, in the podcast show notes, I'm going to tell you about the reasons for the rise of China in the world marketplace, such as agriculture, industry, technology, and military. These are called the four modernizations. After Chairman Mao, I call him Murderer Mao, died in 1976, 
Certain of the communist leaders realized that to succeed in world market, they must attempt to pattern what the leading non-communist nations were doing, that is, free enterprise. They realized they must move toward capitalism to become competitive in world trade. But they decided to code their terminology in new language, so they would still be identified as communist. They realized that their previous programs of mass starvation, torture, forced labor, and personal regimentation were achieving the opposite of motivating the collective Chinese people. So in the show notes of this podcast, I discussed to you how quantitative easing carried out in the United States and other factors have fed potential inflation and how the United States leaned on communist China to purchase U.S. Treasury bonds. By the way, 83 members of communist China's National People's Congress, the NPC, are billionaires. That's billionaire with a B in terms of U.S. dollars. So there's a multiple formation being planned by Satan. At the same time as the kings of the East are being forged militarily, politically, and culturally, so is an economic front that will force itself into new global governance. The formation of a global elite sector, a small group of people, extremely wealthy and powerful, who control political and economic sectors, that's in preparation for the global equalization. Now, there's a lot of other players in the Sino-Asian emergence, and I've noticed those in detail in the show notes of the podcast, so you want to read those. And also I have discussed a comparison of India and Pakistan in military prowess. And I've given you a lot of resources in the show notes. And by the way, in the show notes, I've given you a lot of links, such as global firepower of different nations. You can see where they rank. Right now, you'll see that China and India are two out of the four top players in the world. These top four players are the USA, China, Russia, and India. And by the way, this does not take into account nuclear capabilities. But if you include nuclear capabilities, then the kings of the east, east of the Euphrates River, would be a formidable military threat. And they include Pakistan, North Korea, Japan, Iran, and Turkey. Israel needs to be prepared. And that's exactly the purpose of this podcast. So I've got lots of material in the show notes of the podcast that I'm not going to cover during the audio section in the podcast itself. But let me give you a quick summary. In conclusion, it's evident that China and India are two of the fastest growing economic and military powers in the world. The Euphrates River will prepare the way for the kings of the east. Whether or not the Euphrates River has more or less water in the future may have more to do with soil impaction or alignment than hydrological forces. It remains to be seen. But it will be a vital variable in the logistics of the eastern ranged kings who come or are drawn to the battle of the great day of El Shaddai, God Almighty. In the last days, there will be a major military, political, and economic force that arises from the east. This force will not be just from one national entity, but will be a confluence of several regional powers in the east, not just from the Pacific Rim. Direction in the Holy Bible, again, is always oriented from Jerusalem. So these kings of the east can represent forces in the Near East, Middle East, and or the Far East. Be aware, the Sino-Asian emergence is a key construct in end times prophetic fulfillment. The rapid Sino-Asian emergence that is developing now is a sign of the end of the time in Asia as in other sectors of the world the stage is being set where the kings of the east will have their function in the final days of planet earth when Mashiach Yeshua Messiah Jesus comes to earth to establish his kingdom. So you need to share this information with your friends and your brothers and sisters in Israel. Israel needs to know what's happening. This has been your friend, Prince Hanley, coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure, healing, miracle-working love. Baruch Abba, Adonai.